So we are talking here today with Mike Levin, associate faculty member at the Wies Institute, and Mike also is the Vannevar Bush professor at Tufts University and the director of the Allen Discovery Center here at Tufts University. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Mike, you're one of the leading scientists in the relatively young field of bioelectricity. Can you explain a little bit to us what bioelectricity means and how you're investigating this interesting phenomenon in the laboratory? Sure. Um, bioelectricity actually has a very long history. So people have been interested in how living things respond to and secrete electrical signals for over 100 years. What basically it amounts to is the study of how all cells, not just neurons, but all cells in the body, communicate via electrical signals. And my lab in particular is looking at not only the mechanisms by which cells receive and transmit electrical signals, but how networks of these kinds of cells form electrical networks for information processing. People think about electric signals, basically. They, they imagine signals that are passed on between neurons and along nerve fibers. But the type of bioelectricity that you're talking about is something very much different, isn't it? Whereas neural uh, types of uh, networks and, and nervous systems process electrical signals to guide the movement of the body in three-dimensional space, so for behavior. Bioelectrical signals are used to coordinate the movement of cells in what's known as morphospace, or the shape of all possible anatomical configurations of a particular body. So here, the electrical signaling is used to specify cell behavior, to construct or repair specific anatomical structures, whereas neurons use a much more rapid propagation of these signals to guide behavior and movement in 3D space. But they share a lot in common because if you think about where neurons came from in the first place, neurons evolved from much more primitive cell types that used electrical signaling long before brains and nervous systems appeared. So even very simple organisms like bacteria, fungi, yeast, uh, all of these already use all of the same machinery that uh, neurons use. From where you and your lab stand right now, what would you say are the real big challenges? The, the fundamental challenge in this field is what we call cracking the bioelectric code. So we can track at the level of individual cells how these types of electrical signals propagate into changes of gene expression and other uh, activities of the cell. This is more or less understood. So we now know how these things happen at a single cell level. What we don't know and where the big opportunity for uh, advances in this field are is really to find out how the propagation of electrical signals on the large scale through whole tissues and organs represent the information that they need in order to fix or create very complex specific structures. So understanding how this type of anatomical information is encoded in electrical networks is the big challenge. And this is a very tough multidisciplinary problem, but the big intellectual challenge is cracking the morphogenetic code. What are the kind of model organisms that you're using in the laboratory and why do you pick those? Mm -hmm. We have a, a section of our, uh, of our team works on what's called primitive cognition. So it's the way that very simple organisms without uh, nervous systems are able to make decisions, store memories. We are looking at the very evolutionary beginnings of the integration of brain and body. And so for these purposes, we use bacteria and we use slime molds and we have uh, some ciliates known as volvox. We have, uh, of course, frog embryos. We use quite a bit of uh, planaria, flat, regenerative flatworms. So these are flatworms. They're fairly complex organisms. They have many different cell and tissue types. They have a true brain, most of the same neurotransmitters that you and I have. And they are able to regenerate every part of the body. So when they are injured, every fragment of the animal can regrow exactly what's needed, no more, no less. So if a worm can be cut into multiple different pieces, every piece regenerates everything it needs and rescale so that you have a perfect tiny little worm. And this is simply an amazing uh, capacity. But even beyond planaria, even complex uh, vertebrates like frogs have an ability to repair uh, some complex structures. So for example, tadpoles with abnormal faces will eventually metamorphose into frogs with pretty normal faces. And this ability to build a specific anatomical structure from different starting conditions and stop when it's finished is one of the big open problems of developmental biology and regenerative medicine today. So bioelectricity or electricity in general was seen in the past often as the spark of life, like if you imagine the story of Frankenstein, for instance. How does this relate to the to the to the, the vast popularity of genetics and um, biochemical approaches that then took over basically in history? Yeah, so so I think it's fair to say that bioelectricity and bioelectric properties are the spark of life because bioelectric states are only present as long as the cell is alive. When the cell and tissue are alive, uh, they have a bioelectric potential between the inside and the outside, 
And as soon as that potential collapses, the cell is dead, which is exactly why molecular genetics and, and biochemistry have taken over in recent decades, because bioelectricity cannot be done in fixed tissue. So the minute your tissue is fixed or it is uh, dissociated into molecules for various kinds of analysis, you can do transcriptomics, proteomics. You can, you can profile the molecules in the cells and tissues that have been completely dissociated. But bioelectricity isn't like that. It can only be done in the living state. And so the tools for studying bioelectrics in vivo have really only become available in the last decade or, or let's say 15 years. And it's quite a bit more challenging than existing approaches for chemical signals like, uh, like transcription and, and protein activity. You have a very diverse portfolio of interests um, in your laboratory going on. And um, thinking back into the past, can you tell us what, what inspired you to pursue this this line of research. In 1986, I was at the World's Fair in Vancouver, Canada. I was in a, uh, in a used bookshop and I found this book by Robert Becker called The Body Electric. And what was remarkable about that book was that, you know, among other things, uh, it goes back and it cites all these papers going back, you know, from before 1900 to people who actually thought about electrical signaling outside of the nervous system during embryogenesis and fungi and plants and all these different things. And that was a very defining moment for me because it, it became obvious that other people have actually um, found evidence of this kind of thing. And it just wasn't it wasn't particularly known. If I had to pick one moment, I would say that would be that would be the time where it really gelled for me that that this does make sense, that evolution really did discover um, how good the biophysics of electricity is for computing and for and processing it. As, as an associate faculty member with the Wies Institute, you're collaborating with a number of our faculty, especially Don Ingber, I guess, and Jim Scollins, on different projects. What makes these projects, in your mind, interesting? Yeah, my involvement in the Wies research uh, programs are, um, is, is an incredibly uh, interesting to me because there's so much going on there, and in particular, we found some very important uh, in interplay between signals that are emerging from the brain and bioelectrical signals from the rest of the body that govern immunity. This, is, this has been very interesting to us. The most recent project with, uh, uh, with Don and, and uh, Richard uh, Novak concerns uh, biostasis and the idea that we might be able to slow biological time. And from the perspective of your lab, how are you contributing to, to the biostasis project? What we're doing right now is, first of all, perfecting uh, novel uh, indicators or reporters of biological time. So new fluorescent constructs that report either cell cycle or calcium signaling or metabolic uh, activity, different different ways to visualize biological time in uh, the frog embryo. Aside from that, we're also testing several uh, really interesting candidate compounds that, that we have uh, come up with that are potential stasis inducers and potential ways to slow down biological time. And in the future, we will be looking for more such compounds and mining some of the novel model systems we have here for ways that they regulate their own and each other's time. So this is a discovery platform. Thanks very much, Mike, for your time. And Thank you so much. And for your really nice insights into your work. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much.